So today I'm going to show you how to do the three stations for the intermediate New York State Intermediate Practice Test. And so you're going to do watch the three stations, see what they are. I'd like you to highlight the sections that I'm doing and performing so that you understand what it is that you need to do for the test. The main and most important part of actually doing the three stations is actually just reading and following the instructions. So the instructions aren't difficult, but there are many steps to um, the, each station that you need to follow and make sure you don't miss. And so um, for the practice test, I can sit there and go through some of it so that you have an idea what it is that you can do, um, but you're actually going to need to read and do it on your own when it comes time for the practice test. I'm not going to be assisting you. I might say, hey, read step four again, but I can't help you, especially when we get to the real test. I cannot help you. So I'm going to give you the stations, have you work through some of it, um, but first I want you to watch the videos of what the stations are as I'm reading through each of the steps. So. Um, Hopefully this will help you out when it comes to actually doing the practice test. Okay, let me show you station number one. Hi, so today we're going to be doing an activity that is um, the practice lab stations for the New York State Science Test. And so um, I have, have the setup in front of me. The stations aren't going to be one, two, three, but they're going to be X, Y, Z. And the first station is station X. So you're going to turn to your paper that you got to station X. And I'm going to read through all the directions as I'm doing the steps. So I'm going to go right through this as we're going along. The station, when you come to a station, you'll see a station diagram that will be taped down. This one's not taped down. You're going to see a station diagram that's taped down over on the left that tells you everything that it is that you need. And it says that I need to have a golf ball that's in a bag. So there'll be a golf ball that's sitting over here. Uh, and this is the setup that it shows. And then there's a mat here that will be taped down that has um, some ruler marks on it and a cup. So I'm going to read through the directions right now so that you can um, follow along. And I'd like you to highlight the steps as I read them so that I know that you're with me. So right now it's a Station X experimenting with a ball and ramp. And it tells you first what the task is. It says, at this station, you will observe a ball rolling down a ramp and moving a plastic cup. When you, will later, you, will then, excuse me, you will then identify some variables that will affect how far the cup moves. Finally, you will design an experiment and formulate a hypothesis. Do not move the ramp setup. So you're not moving anything. If you move anything or take tape off, it's going to mess up um, for the next person that moves to this station. So the, and then it says again underneath, do not move the ramp set up. So please don't move anything. Leave everything securely there. Now I'm going to read the directions step by step and do what it says. It says first, be sure the cup is at the starting circle, which is this circle right here, with the opening of the cup, which is this opening right here, facing the end of the ruler at the start of each trial. So it's going to need to be returned here at each trial. Step number two, take the golf ball out of the bag. Step number three, place the ball on the ramp or the ruler so that the middle of the ball is at the 15 centimeter mark. There's 15 centimeters. Without pushing the ball, carefully release the ball so it goes into the cup. Note the distance the cup moves. So how does far does the cup move? There's a ruler here. So I'm going to look at the back of the cup and I'm going to note how much it moves. It moved 13.5 centimeters. Record the distance it moved to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. So I'm going to take my pencil and I'm going to write 13.5 on that first part of the data table. So right in here, I'm going to write it right in the data table. Then I go on to step six, or excuse me, step five. Step five, with the cup returned to the starting circle. So now I'm going to return this to the starting circle. I'm going to release the golf ball from the 20 centimeter mark. So I'm going to go up a little bit higher this time, up to 20 centimeters and from the 20 centimeter mark and record the distance the cup moves again to the nearest tenth of a centimeter on the, di the diagram. So from 20, I move this again. I look and see, this time it went 7 or 16.8 it looks like. So I'm going to record 16.8. Then I go to step six. Step number six, it says, with the cup returned to the starting circle, release the golf ball from the 25 centimeter mark on the ruler. So I'm going up to 25 centimeters. Record the distance the cup moves to the nearest tenth of a centimeter in the data table. So I'm going to release it. Where did it go this time? Oh, this time it's at 21.5. 
So I'm going to write 21.5. Then it says for step number seven, with the cup return to the starting circle each time, release the golf ball two more times from the 25 centimeter mark on the, the ruler. Each time, record the distance the cup moves to the nearest tenth of a centimeter on the data table. So again, it says two more times. So I'm going to go 25 centimeters. I'm going to release it. Hello. So I'm at uh, 20.19. And then I'm going to do it again from the 25 centimeter mark. And it's 17.5. And I'm going to record that on here. And so now I should have five data points on my table. So I've done now seven. I'm at step number eight. You found, probably found that the cup traveled slightly different distances when you released the ball three times from the 25 centimeter mark. Give two reasons that might explain why the cup did not stop at the exact same spot each time. Your first reason and your second reason. So why wouldn't the ball have stopped at the same part point every time? Why is it that it's somewhere different? That's the questions you're gonna answer. Then we go on to Step number nine, it says, think about how you might design a new experiment. So this is a think, you're thinking. Think how you might design the new experiment. And in this experiment, you wanna study how changing the mass of the cup will change the distance it's moved on the golf ball. Assume that the equipment set up for the new experiment will be the same as it is now. The data table of this new experiment is shown below. And then it says, do not actually fill in the data table. So now you're thinking about a situation. There's weights right here. If I add more weight to this cup, what's gonna happen about the distance that the cup's gonna move? What would happen this time? And they show you an example of the different masses. So they're saying it's 20 grams, 40 grams, 60 grams, and 80 grams. As I add more of these little blue weights on, what's gonna happen to the distance the cup moves? Then number 10, what would you recommend about the release point of the golf ball each time a new cup is tested? So what would you recommend? If that's the case, if I'm changing the cup, where would you release the ball from? Where would it be released from? That's what they're asking there. And then write a hypothesis about the distance the cups of different masses are moved by the ball. So what's your hypothesis? I believe the ball will move the cup this far at the different distances, or there won't be any change, or however it is. So you have to write a, a, a hypothesis. So that's station number one, So or station X, excuse me. So hopefully you have an understanding of what it is so that when you are able to do this on your own, you'll um, be able to read the steps and know what it is that you're looking for. Thank you. Okay, class, we are now on station Y. So we're on the next station. This is soaps and water. So you're just turning into the next station. Some people might start here. Again, I'm reading the task at the very, very top. And it says, at this station, you will determine some properties of the soap samples and predict how they will behave if they are placed in water. You will then place the two objects in, wa two objects in water and compare their densities. So you're going to be calculating the density of something. So the directions, number one, to protect the soap samples, do not take them out of the plastic bags and do not place the soaps in the water. Disregard any effect the plastic bags will have on all measurements and calculations. So they're just saying that this stuff is in plastic, it's in there for a reason, and leave it be. Then it says step number two, what is the number on the bag for soap A and what is the number on the bag for soap B? So they're asking for this number here, there's a little label with a number on it. This is for scoring purposes so that we know what soap you had because the shapes of the soap and the, and the um, size of the soap may differ from station to station. So you'd be putting down for this one, if I, there should be the same number, but for me it would be station um, A, soap A is three, and soap B, here is seven. So the, the labels are on there. This is for, again, scoring purposes. That's all they're asking. Then it says, use the data table below to record the answers to four through seven. Now, people get to this data table here and they stop and they say, I don't know what to do, miss. Don't stop. It's just telling you, record your answers here when you get to them for four through seven. So you're gonna read through, it's going to tell you what to do, but you're gonna record your answers here. Step number four, it says, measure the mass of soap A and measure the mass of soap B. Record the values to the nearest tenth of a, a, tenth of a gram for each of the data table above. Note that the unit grams has been provided for you, so you don't have to add grams to this. So I'm going to take soap A, use my triple beam, now finding a mass, what equipment would I use that I have in front of me, the triple beam balance. 
So I'm going to use a triple beam balance, always starting with the center and try and find the mass. Too heavy, too light, good. Next one, too heavy, too heavy, too heavy, too heavy, too heavy, too heavy, too light. I'm at zero, making sure that it's in the notches. And then I do the ones until I'm all the way balanced. Now what's great is that a calculator is provided for me. So um, as a table example that we gave when I was having you use it, I had you write down each number, each of the values. For this situation, you're actually going to just punch them in the calculator and record them on the data table under mass. So I would say 100 plus 0 plus 7.4 equals and I'd take that value, 107.4, and I'd record it under mass for A. So I would do that, then I would come and I'd take this off, reset these to zero, and I would do the same thing for soap B. So now soap B, same thing, gonna put it on. Too heavy, I'm on the tens. Too light, wait, too heavy, too light, good. So now I need to even it off. And here's my value. Again, I'm going to use the calculator. Millie just came in, so I'm going to talk for a second. I'm recording my lesson for tomorrow so that I don't have to keep talking. Okay, back to you. So, <laughs> uh, no, it's not garbage. So, I now have my values, it's 0, 100, so again, I'm gonna add them together, 0, 100, put a zero in, plus, I have 30, plus, this time it's 7.2, so I'm gonna put 7.2, I'm gonna hit equals, and I get my value, 37.2, and I'm gonna write that under mass for soap B. So I'm gonna record the two values. Now I am done with that step, that was step number four. I'm now on step number five, it says, Measure the length, width, and height of soap A to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. Only soap A are you doing this for. Only soap A. And this is like we were doing with the blocks. It's three sides. There should be three different values because all the sides, none of the sides are the same. So you're going to measure it to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. You're going to record these dimensions on the workspace provided below. Substitute to the values in the formula provided and then use a calculator to determine the volume of the soap A. Show your work in the space below and record your value to the nearest tenth of a centimeter in the data table. So you're going to record all of the data right here in the data table and you're going to use this formula, length times width times height, to calculate what the volume is. So I'm going to take my ruler, always using the metric sign, starting at zero, and I'm going to measure just three different sides. It really doesn't matter the order, it's the value that comes out that's important. So it looks like I got seven point something. So I'm going to write that down. I'm going to do the second one, going across. This one is four point something. And then I'm going to do the third one. And I'm going to copy that one down. And it's two point something. I'm not giving you the values because I want you to do this on your own. So that's why. So I'm going to record all those values down. And then I'm going to, again, use the formula that's here, length times width times height. I'm going to calculate that out on the calculator to get my value. I'm going to record it in my workspace and show my work, but I'm also going to take this value to the nearest tenth, so one decimal point, and I'm going to put it up on volume for soap A. Then I'm at step six. It says measure for soap A. Again, for soap A, I don't need it anymore. Substitute the values for mass and volume in the formula provided, the formula that they've given you. So you're going to calculate Using, then use the calculator, again, you have the calculator, to determine the density of soap A. Show your work in the space below and record your values to the ten, nearest tenth of grams per cubic centimeter in the data table. So I'm going to take my mass and put it here. I'm going to put my volume and put it there. I'm going to do mass divided by volume, but I'm going to show my work and then have my answer there and then take this answer and put it up in the top for soap A. Then it says, note the density of soap B has been provided for you in the data table. For soap B, substitute your values for mass and density in the formula provided. 
Then use a calculator to determine the volume of soap B. Show your work on that space below and record your value to the nearest tenth of a centimeter on the data table for pa pa on page 42. So for this one, they want you to calculate the, vo the volume. You've now got the mass and you have this empty space here that is volume. And this is actually more difficult than the actual test, so I'm going to give you the formula for this so that you can figure it out. Um, so let me, let me do that for you. Of course, I don't have a pencil on me here. So in this scenario, if you recall, I gave you that density, density equals mass over volume. I gave you that. And to find the volume, you would cover up the V, and it would be density. It would be density, or um, excuse me, cover volume, mass over density. So D equals, or excuse me, V equals mass over density. So if you could copy this down so you have it for next time, that's going to be the formula that you use when you're doing this. I would calculate that value to figure out the volume, and then I would record it on the space provided. I'm on step number eight, and it says the diagram below represents a glass container with water. Think about what would happen if soap A and soap B were removed from the plastic bags and placed in this container. Remember, do not actually put the soaps in the water. So they're saying if you took soap, if you would, would take them in, take the two soaps and put them in the water, you're not going to. If you were to put them in the water, where would they be? And then they show this diagram here. And it says, base your answers to nine and 10 on the data table on 42, so on this side. Right, which block in the diagram above shows where soap A would be if it were placed in the container of water? Is it block one, block two, block three, block four? So you're gonna look over at the density over here and say where that block would fall in some water that has a density of 1.0. And then for the second one, for 10, it says which block in the diagram above shows uh, where soap B would be placed if it's in the container. So now you're going to look at soap B, which has a density of 0 0.8. Which one of those shows a density of 0 0.8? Block 1, block 2, block 3, or block 4. And then we go to step number 11. Step number 11 says take the rubber ball and the styrofoam ball out of the plastic bag. These are important. I don't have these, so please don't take them from me. Please keep them here. I'll give you some rubber balls if you want a rubber ball. Please don't take these. But take the rubber ball and the styrofoam ball out of the bag. Place them in the plastic cup of water. Now, I didn't put cups of my water in here because I don't want to show you the answer, but I would place them in the cup of water. Observe the positions of the balls in the water. So where are they sitting in the water? Based on the observations, how does the density of the rubber ball compare to the density of the styrofoam ball? Explain your answer. So they're asking you which is more dense and how do you know? Then you're supposed to remove the ball, them from the cup. You'll have some paper towels there. So, and then you're going to turn the balls into the bag and put all the materials back and you're done with that station. So that is station Y.